Hello there, my name is Grace Oliver and I'm a student at the University of Winchester and today I'll be giving a presentation on the use of hyperflexion in dressage. We will cover some of the statistics of the global equine industry and the industry in the UK as well as a brief introduction to the International Equestrian Federation or FEI and to dressage as a sport. We will then look at the use of hyperflexion and discuss some of the welfare issues that have been identified as well as the, uh, the controversy over whether there can be good hyperflexion or not. Finally, we will examine the rules provided by the FEI regarding the use of hyperflexion and suggest some actions that could be taken in the future to maximise the welfare of horses in dressage. The Equine Business Association values the global equine industry at a total of $300 billion, with the biggest markets including Europe valued at $133 billion, the United States at $102 billion and Canada valued at $16 billion. The UK is further down the list but is still worth a significant $6 billion. This industry involves vast numbers of animals and can generally be divided into core activities, those that are based on the use or ownership of horses, and the provision of horse-related goods to be used in those activities, such as feed suppliers and veterinary services. In the UK, some 27 million people have an interest in the horse industry, with 1.8 million regular riders and 847,000 horses. As is generally the case with the rest of the world, large numbers of these horses are trained and used for activities from leisure riding, riding lessons and trekking, all the way up to professional competition in dressage, show jumping and racing. All of these activities can potentially put the welfare of the animals involved at risk and so a number of organisations were created to ensure the interests of both horses and the humans involved are being met. The International Equestrian Federation is an international body made up of 136 member federations and was created in 1921 in order to generate international rules initially overseeing the Olympic equestrian disciplines such as jumping, dressage and eventing but more recently they also oversee non-Olympic disciplines like driving, endurance, vaulting, reining and para-equestrian sports. The FEI's mission is to drive and develop equestrian sport globally in a modern, sustainable and structured manner with a fair and ethical partnership with the horse. Whether the FEI is meeting its mission statement in all areas is often a point of contention for those concerned about equine welfare, especially in the field of dressage. Dressage has been an Olympic discipline for many years, but can also be competed at all levels, nationally and internationally. International tests are the highest level of difficulty and are the same across the world, while national tests are designed by the governing body of each country. At international level, there are four separate levels. The horse and rider are both judged on the performance of specific movements, the quality of the horse's gait in cooperation with the rider and those scoring the highest percentage will win the class. The horses involved at the highest levels can be worth millions, especially champions such as Morlands, Totilus and Vallegro, who is worth around six million. The FEI's primary objective of dressage is to develop the horse into a happy athlete, and in many cases it could be said that this is achieved, look at Vallegro, but some of the practices used in the sport may actually achieve the opposite. There are many different rationales and methods used to train dressage horses and the horse itself is able to sustain a wide range of different head and neck positions during training. The concept of being on the bit originally referred to the relaxation of the jaw and the pole and correct schooling would be where the pole is the highest point of the neck and the horse's nose is just in front of the vertical line. Have a look at the diagrams for examples. The horse should be able to maintain this posture for periods of time and the top line, the muscles along the neck and the back, develop in such a way that self-carriage is possible. In competition, the FEI dressage directive states that the nose should be maintained in front of the vertical line. This does not appear to apply to horses being warmed up prior to competing, which is where hyperflexion is most commonly seen. Hyperflexion, otherwise known as being overbent, behind the vertical, or in extreme cases roll cur, is the dorsoventral overbending of the horse's neck towards the chest using coercive force. In the most extreme cases the horse's nose can touch the chest. 
This position can be achieved using the reins or by applying draw reins to the animal to maintain a relentless bit pressure. In doing so, the back is raised and the centre of gravity is shifted back onto the hind limbs. This allows for greater hop flexion and for the forelimbs to move more freely, something that is desirable for high marks in dressage movements. The likelihood of the head position being behind the vertical in top level dressage has increased from 1992 to 2008 and may have increased further since then. The FEI initially defined hyperflexion as a technique of working or training to provide a degree of longitudinal flexion of the mid region of the neck that cannot be self maintained by the horse for a prolonged time without welfare implications. This was then updated in 2010 to add flexion of the horse's neck achieved through aggressive force. But note that the definitions provided by the FEI don't clearly define how long that prolonged time is, nor do they define aggressive force or even welfare. In this case, we will use Broom's definition of welfare as the state of an individual as it attempts to cope with its environment, as well as considering the five freedoms when we examine the reported welfare issues caused by hyperflexion. The first welfare issue that we're going to look at is the contribution of hyperflexion to the nuchal bursae. From a veterinary perspective, hyperflexion might lead to pain or injury. A 2006 study examined 10 equine cadavers and simulated the stress placed on the nuchal ligament by hyperflexion by measuring the pressure placed on the head and the neck in different flex positions. Hyperflexion was associated with the highest pressure values and might influence the development of a nuchal bursa. This can lead to swelling and pain in the pole, abnormal head or neck movement or even sepsis from bursitis. This research would suggest that hyperflexion, especially in horses that are at risk of developing nuchal bursae, is not advisable. The next welfare issue is the potential for hyperflexion to significantly compromise the vision of the horse. Both Harman and McGreevy both state that when horses are moving through space, they need to use a binocular visual field as opposed to the lateral vision that they utilise when grazing to scan the horizon. If the horse's head is significantly overbent, the forward vision required for seeing in three dimensions is severely restricted and the animal can't see in front of itself. McGreevy suggests that rendering the horse somewhat powerless in this way may be useful for riding them in difficult competitions, especially where the horse is highly strung. This contradicts the five freedoms, obviously, as the animal can't express normal behaviour if it can't see properly. And as a prey animal, vision restriction may cause significant fear. As hyperflexion is asked for using the same signal as deceleration, pressure on the bit from the reins, horses might confuse one for the other. This violates the principles of learning theory and can lead to dangerous conflict behaviours such as rearing or flexion of the neck when deceleration is what is required. This can be dangerous for the horse and the rider. The pressure on the mouth required to obtain a hyperflex neck position can be very great, especially when compared to the rein tension required to ride in a loose frame. This in itself is a welfare concern, as the horse's face and mouth are highly enervated and are extremely sensitive to pain, and horses show significantly higher incidence of conflict behaviour with the head in response to greater bit pressure. Some behavioural studies were carried out and showed that horses did find hyperflexion and roll cut aversive. Um, a 2008 study examined the response of horses to a coercively obtained roll cut position. In particular, giving them the choice in the form of a Y maze, where one arm led to a short round of extreme hyperflexion and the other led to a round of normal pole flexion. Behavioural and physiological measures taken found that during hyperflexion, the horses moved significantly more slowly and displayed behavioural signs of discomfort such as bucking, head tossing and tail swishing. 14 out of the 15 horses chose normal flexion significantly more often than the roll cur option, suggesting that it is more aversive than working in a natural head and neck position. Eight of these horses were also subjected to fear tests following a ride in hyperflexion and tended to react more strongly and take longer to approach both novel and looming stimuli. This has implications for rideability and suggests that riding horses in this overbent position causes them stress, discomfort and could lead to an increased occurrence of dangerous evasive behaviour. The concept of good and bad hyperflexion has been discussed in the literature. Uh, some horses don't appear to show the same changes in cortisol concentrations or signs of stress that other horses do and based on the current evidence unridden horses seem to tolerate hyperflexion much more readily than ridden horses. As a result of this several studies do claim that there are no negative physiological effects caused by hyperflexion and thus they support its use in training to improve hop flexion and to lighten the forehand. This research however 
has generally used horses that are already habituated to the use of roll cur and hyperflexion techniques, which doesn't necessarily mean that they don't find it aversive. Learned helplessness, where the animal superficially tolerates pain when there is no obvious alternative, is a very strong possibility, although the evidence for this in horses is currently lacking. Many horses are capable of tolerating very unethical riding techniques, so this should be taken into consideration. Research into the welfare issues surrounding hyperflexion commonly ignore the psychological aspect of welfare, instead choosing to focus entirely on physiological parameters. These measures, such as blood cortisol levels and heart rate, are well known for being less accurate, especially in prey animals like horses. Blood cortisol levels will rise in response to a variety of environmental factors, including strenuous activities such as that semen being ridden in a hyperflex position. Heart rate variability is a much more accepted measure, but that is less commonly seen in this research and can still be affected by exercise. Preference testing, such as the YMA study I talked about earlier, is more of a gold standard that can provide a much more direct insight into how the animal perceives the stimulus and allows us to include psychological measures in our assessment of welfare. As we discussed briefly earlier in this presentation, as of 2010, the FEI takes a stance on hyperflexion of any form of aggressive riding must be sanctioned. This resulted from a petition of 41,000 signatories against the use of hyperflexion and roll care, but the roundtable meeting didn't change the rules then and they still remain the same today. The current FEI dressage rules repeatedly state that the head should remain slightly in front of the vertical in all work, even at the halt. Non-compliance with this rule at an FEI event will cause the rider to receive a yellow warning card issued by the ground jury, the steward or the technical delegate. Receiving more than one yellow warning card will suspend the person responsible for two months. Sanctions can be given for aggressive riding, but the FEI don't make it clear how these will be implemented or how they will implement anti-hyperflexion policies in the future to prevent its occurrence in warm-up rings. Some riders, such as Swedish rider Patrick Kittel, have been given official warnings for warming their horse up in a roll cut position, but further action hasn't been taken. The increase in head and neck position being behind the vertical over the years also suggests that judges do not penalise riders when they see it occurring. The FEI needs to work closely in conjunction with the research available in order to more clearly define hyperflexion, especially in comparison to low, deep and round riding, which they consider to be acceptable. Better boundaries as to what degree of pole flexion is acceptable and how long a period of time should be allowed behind the vertical before warnings are given will allow for more specific rules to be put in place. More effective implementation of these rules might help to prevent the practice both in competition and in the warm-up ring. Stronger punishments might be most effective as a deterrent, as well as including better monitoring measures like the use of CCTV in warm-up rings. Thank you for listening to my presentation on the use of hyperflexion in dressage horses. To summarise, hyperflexion is an ever-increasing issue in the dressage world and the trend for bringing horses behind the vertical may potentially be putting their welfare at risk. The horse may suffer painful bursitis of the nuchal ligament, may have its vision severely restricted causing stress and inability to move correctly and may experience discomfort and confusion. Horses have been found to find this technique aversive and as a result the FEI needs to better regulate the practice during competitions by introducing stricter rules and tougher punishments. For further information on this topic take a look at the extra links I have provided. If you have any questions I'll leave my email address in the description box. I'd be very happy to answer them. Thank you so much for listening.